Hello, welcome everybody to the Georgia Tech Graph Theory Seminar. Uh, our speaker today is Zdenek Dvorja from uh, Charles University in Prague, and uh, he will tell us about fractional chromatic number of graphs with bounded maximum degree. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And it's great to be back in Atlanta, at least <laughs> virtually. Okay, so the starting point for my talk is this uh, well-known theorem of uh, Brooks, which let's do it just for uh, graphs of maximum degree, at least three to avoid this odd cycle. So it tells you that if your graph has maximum degree at most delta and it doesn't contain a clique of size uh, delta plus one, then you can color it using uh, uh, delta colors. So, I mean, basically like the very trivial bound that you can prove for all graphs of, of maximum degree delta is coloring by the delta plus one colors. But then if you exclude this single exceptional graph, then you can improve this bound by plus one. And uh, it's uh, natural to ask whether you cannot improve this a bit. So maybe if you, in addition to this clique with delta plus one vertices for a couple more graphs, can you perhaps decrease this by, by one more, let's say. And so kind of this is uh, the problem that we might consider. So whether there exists, uh, let's say a finite, for simplicity, set of forbidden graphs, which themselves should have a chromatic number greater than delta minus one. So we need to exclude them. But on the other hand, if we forbid all of these uh, subgraphs in a graph of, uh, of maximum degree delta, then we could color this graph using delta minus one colors. So um, basically, what uh, I'm saying here is you consider uh, delta critical graphs of maximum degree delta, but uh, I don't want to go into the definition. So let's uh, let's uh, write this uh, write this uh, this way. And uh, now, actually, the answer on this uh, uh, for this problem depends on the values of delta. So for small values of the maximum degree, like four or five, uh, we know that uh, this is like very false. Uh, we know that for these maximum degrees, deciding whether you can color a graph of maximum degree using uh, maximum degree delta, using delta minus one color is actually NP complete. And so, it definitely cannot be uh, characterized by uh, finitely many forbidden subgraphs, and uh, also it cannot it cannot really be characterized by any easily describable family of, uh, of forbidden subgraphs. May I ask a quick question here, Tini? Yes. Uh, just to, to clarify, the fact that such a finite set of subgraphs does not exist is this for four and five, is the subject to P being not equal to MP or is there an unconditional proof of this particular fact as well? Oh, no, 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 I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, well, okay, that certainly, certainly, uh, well, you, you can you can easily construct infinitely many critical graphs with these parameters and uh, I mean, I mean, okay, one way how to, how to do it, you go into this uh, proof of the NP completeness and mm -hmm. that uh, that gives you a way how to, how to turn, let's say, any, uh, unsatisfiable uh, three set formula into such a graph. Mm -hmm. so, um, okay, uh, on the other hand, if, uh, if your uh, maximum degree delta is large enough, then it's enough to just forbid a single graph, the Greek with uh, delta vertices. So this was proved by Reed for, let's say, delta at least uh, 10 to the 14. And uh, then uh, Borodin and Kostochka conjectured, or actually before that, Borodin and Kostochka conjectured that the same is true actually for any delta which is at least nine. And uh, why they uh, why they put here this nine is because it's uh, it's known that in this in this uh, in this way it is not true 
for smaller delta. So let's say for, for delta eight, there are graphs of uh, some, some further graphs of uh, maximum degree eight, which uh, do not contain clique of size delta, but still cannot be colored uh, using delta minus one colors. And uh, actually, like um, I, I, I kind of thought, thought about uh, thought about this only like a couple of days ago when I was preparing these slides. I actually don't know what is uh, what is the like the suspected answer for for the values between that. So I don't know whether uh, whether for 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 delta six, seven, eight, you can actually hope for finitely many critical graphs or not. So if I, 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 I'm not, uh, I'm not brave enough to claim that uh, this is actually an open question. It's possible that someone studied it and I just don't know about it. But uh, if, uh, if not, I think this will be kind of nice to resolve. Uh, but then, but anyway, so uh, we can sort of see this, uh, this problem as kind of resolved, uh, at least in some vague, uh, uh, vague sense. So how can we how can we move uh, move beyond this? So, I mean, you can always try to go to maximum degree minus uh, minus two and things like that. But let's say that uh, that uh, we would like to stay in the same setting. So we are forbidding, let's say, just clique of size uh, delta, and uh, we want uh, we want to go with the number of colors uh, below delta, and. Uh, so for that, it's uh, convenient to consider some like, less strict notions of coloring, which colorings which do not restrict you just to the to the integers. And the one that I'm will be speaking about uh, in my talk is the fractional coloring, the fractional chromatic number. So let me just give uh, the definition. So. Let's uh, let's let's see how we can somehow fractionalize the uh, the definition of uh, of normal coloring. So in a normal coloring, to each vertex we are assigning a color, which can be, for example, an integer, subject to the condition that uh, whenever two vertices are adjacent, they must get uh, get uh, different colors, and then we are trying to minimize the total number of colors used over the whole graph. And uh, in the fractional coloring, uh, we replace, in, uh, we do a couple of replacements, like instead of uh, like single colors to each vertex, we will be assigning a set of colors. And the set of colors must have a measure one. So we are assigning subsets of some, uh, of some um, Measure measure space, but uh, uh, we can f just imagine that uh, that we are uh, assigning uh, uh, measurable subsets of reals. It doesn't really matter. And uh, then this condition well, basically stays. We cannot use the same color on two adjacent vertices. So for any two adjacent vertices, the sets of colors that we are assigning must be disjoint. And uh, we will be minimizing the total measure of all the, uh, all the colors that we are using on the whole graph. So let me give you an example. So this is some graph, which uh, normally you need uh, three colors to color it. But in this fractional setting, you can do it with eight over three colors. So uh, we will be, the, the color sets that we are, will be assigning will be, uh, will be subsets of this interval from zero to eight over three. And uh, so uh, here we are, let's say, giving this vertex this sub interval of, uh, of size, size one and uh, well, something more interesting, this, uh, this, uh, this vertex we can give this uh, interval from zero to two thirds, and uh, then this uh, interval, additional interval of length one third somewhere here, and so forth. And so you see that uh, to everyone, I am assigning intervals of total length one, 
and uh, if I was careful enough, uh, then on the adjacent vertices, the intervals should be disjoint. And you can, I mean, you should probably imagine that the intervals are open, so they don't in, even intersect at the end points. Okay, and um, so now, of course, it's natural to ask whether you cannot color it uh, like using smaller number of colors. And for that, uh, it's uh, useful to see some basic properties that will be relevant for my talk. So, of course, the fractional, fractional chromatic number, the minimum number of colors that I need to use in this fractional uh, setting is always at most as large as for the normal uh, chromatic number. Because if I have uh, coloring using colors one, two, three, I can just uh, change it to, uh, let's say, coloring by intervals from zero to one and from one to two and from uh, two to three. So I'm getting a fractional coloring using the same, same number of colors. And on the other hand, from below, the fractional chromatic number is, of course, at least as large as the clique number, because whenever I have a clique, uh, the intervals or the sets on each of the uh, of the vertices of the clique must be must be disjoint. So their union must uh, must have the measure which is at least the, the size of the clique. And uh, what will be probably the most relevant for my talk is the relation to independent set, independent sets. So uh, the fractional chromatic number is from below bounded by this ratio of the number of vertices to the size of the largest independent set. And uh, how to see that? Well, basically to, to see that this is true, uh, you need given a fractional coloring using let's say the optimal number of colors, you need to find a large independent set, which you can uh, do, for example, by sampling one point from uh, one color at random. So I don't know why I put this color at random. And now uh, the vertices on, on which this color appears necessarily form an independent set because uh, the same color cannot appear on two adjacent vertices. And uh, the expected size of, uh, of this uh, this independent set by linearity of expectation turns out uh, turns out to be uh, just the number of vertices divided by the fractional chromatic number, and therefore there exists an independent set which is at least as large. And uh, well, conversely, uh, this uh, this tells us that. Uh, the fractional chromatic number must be at least the number of vertices of G divided by the size of the largest independent set. And if you check, well, this, uh, this, ver uh, this graph here has eight vertices and the largest independent set has size three. So I cannot really do any better here than eight over three colors. So this is just kind of an example. So we should now kind of uh, understand how fractional coloring works. And uh, one more thing that uh, we need to know is uh, that uh, this fractional chromatic number can be computed using a linear program. And uh, basically what, uh, what this, uh, well, this linear program has uh, variables for independent sets, and then it has condi this, this condition that basically says that at every vertex, you have the amount of color is one, and then you are minimizing the total amount of color. So um, this is not a 
somehow not, not an efficient way how to compute the fractional uh, uh, chromatic number of course because uh, the number of uh, independent sets in my graph will can be exponential in the number of its vertices so this uh, linear program can have exponential size but uh, for reasonably small graphs you can use this to compute the fractional chromatic number and this will actually be important later in my talk and one more property that uh, follows from this linear programming formulation is uh, that uh, the fractional colorings of, uh, of a graph form uh, a polyhedron in, uh, in some uh, in, in this space. And you can then therefore do with them things like take a convex combination of a couple of fractional colorings. And that is also something that we will need. Uh, okay, so now back uh, to this uh, kind of trying to improve the uh, Brooks theorem. And it turns out that uh, as long as, uh, as you consider the fractional uh, chromatic number, uh, you can almost always improve, uh, improve uh, uh, on Brooks theorem just by forbidding uh, this clique of size delta. So if I have a graph, which let's say is connected, has maximum degree at most delta and doesn't contain a clique of size delta, uh, of size, uh, of size delta, you can fractionally color it using strictly less than delta colors, even by some fixed, uh, fixed amount with two exceptions. There are these, uh, these two exceptional graphs, one with a fractional chromatic number exactly four and one with fractional chromatic number exactly five. But aside for these, uh, from these sporadic examples, you can always uh, get at least some improvement. And uh, therefore we can ask the question like, what is the best possible improvement? So for each, uh, for each delta, we want to know the largest number C that, uh, that we can write here uh, that, uh, that, uh, that works. So we know that for every delta at least three, well, yeah, delta at least three by this uh, result of uh, King and Bang, we have C delta at least two over seven, uh, 67. And um, uh, they in, uh, also proved in, in, their, in their paper that uh, somehow uh, this, uh, this uh, cannot get harder as, uh, as uh, the degree, the delta goes, uh, goes up. So uh, this, uh, this uh, for five, we are always getting at least as good constant as for four up to some up to some ceiling and uh, the same for any uh, any greater delta I, I up to some even bigger ceiling and interestingly they they didn't uh, they didn't prove that uh, that c4 would uh, necessarily be greater than c3 uh, it uh, it uh, almost well, it is conjectured to be uh, greater, so strictly greater than, than C3, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's open. It's not known whether this is the case or not. And so, okay, uh, so, okay. so what is like believed or hoped to be true? So for every delta there is now conjecture by someone, so for the smallest delta for delta three, it has been conjectured by uh, Karl Heckman and uh, Robin Thomas that the best value is one over five. So every subcubic triangle free graph has a fractional chromatic number at most 14 over five. And for four and five, King and Peng conjectured that one third should be the best bound. 
and then Edwards and King uh, conjecture for six, seven, and eight that one half should be the best bound. And then from the from this uh, conjecture of Borodin and Kostochka, it follows that for delta at least nine, one should be uh, the right bound. Okay, so this is like the I, I mean uh, there are, there are reasons why 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 these values are here because well there are uh, there are graphs for uh, for which uh, for which uh, here the fractional chromatic number is uh, exactly delta minus one over three and for here for delta minus one over two and uh, so okay this is what we hope for what we actually know well. Um, with uh, Jean Sebastian Sereni and uh, Honza Volac, we proved a couple of years ago uh, that uh, this conjecture for delta equals to three is actually true, that you can do it. And then for four and five, as far as I know, the best current best known bound is still this one by uh, King and Peng. And then for the large uh, larger value, uh, Edwards and King found some some better values of uh, of uh, well, some better, some some greater improvements using some partially computer assisted things. So they are, they are, some some of these numbers are kind of well, not uh, well, not uh, not precise. And uh, then I think the uh, this uh, the, there was a little progress for a couple of uh, couple of years. Uh, then uh, uh, Xiaolan Hu and Peng uh, uh, got, uh, got interested in it and uh, they had some uh, new ideas for this case equal to delta four. So they now almost certainly have to prove that uh, C4 is at least one over, uh, one over A. And uh, then I started working with them, and now we think that we might be able to get uh, C4 to be also at least one over five. But this is a work in progress, so uh, it's, we are not we are not quite uh, there, there, quite there yet. Okay, uh, so uh, may I ask another quick question? So if, yep. if, if this work in progress turns out to be correct and C4 is at least one over five, by the results you mentioned earlier, this implies that also for like five, six, seven, et cetera. So yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, uh, but so now I would still like to think, think uh, or speak about, uh, about uh, this case, this case delta equals to three. So, I mean, in this, uh, for this case, we know the exact value, but uh, in some sense, the answer still is not quite satisfactory. So we know that uh, the answer is right, that you cannot in, in general, like get better bound than this 14 over five, because there are uh, these two uh, graphs, which have fractional chromatic number exactly 14 over five. Uh, but it turns out uh, that these are the only connected triangle-free subcubic graphs which have this fractional chromatic number. So these are not uh, not some somehow some fundamental reasons why 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 this is fourteen over five. These are just some sporadic examples. And uh, so actually, what we what we would rather like to have is uh, to get the best bound, which is not subject to just having a uh, couple of uh, finite number of simple contraexamples. So we would actually like uh, to have this uh, this improvement here, which holds well, the best such improvement, which holds for all but uh, finitely many graphs. I put here some uh, connectivity condition, which uh, Kind of makes makes sense. I uh, I probably should uh, should have formulated this uh, this uh, problem again in terms of uh, critical graphs, but uh, uh, this is to avoid some some trivialities. 
And uh, the conjecture is that the right answer is one over, uh, one over three. And I will explain in a couple of, uh, couple of minutes why this value of one over three seems to be the right one. Uh, but I would like also like to mention that, of course, uh, the same thing is completely open for any greater delta and probably uh, we are very far from actually being able to say ab uh, anything about it for delta equals to four because, I mean, as the first step, you would like to, of course, get uh, get at least these uh, at least these bounds, the exact bounds here, and then perhaps you can <laughs> think about uh, about improving them. But I, in in a, in any case, I don't can't really tell you, tell you anything about this for any other delta than three. Okay, so. While, while, while this uh, answer. Well, for that, uh, we can again uh, go back to this relationship to the uh, independent sets. And so recall that, uh, uh, that uh, we have uh, that the fractional chromatic number of, a, of any graph is at least the number of vertices divided by the size of the largest independent set, uh, or in other words, uh, so I could also write it like that the ratio of the, uh, of the independence, uh, independence number to the number of vertices is at least uh, inverse to fractional chromatic number. So if we, if we want to show uh, that uh, the fractional chromatic number of something is large, we'd better also be able, uh, sorry, something is small, we'd better also be able to show that this uh, this uh, ratio is, uh, is large, that we have large independent sets. And uh, uh, for this, there, there is a, a lot of, uh, actually a lot of, uh, a lot of results of uh, form uh, that uh, I don't know if uh, maximum degree is at most four and you four bit triangles and you get uh, large, uh, large independent sets, things like that. I will not uh, go through uh, all of them or I will basically just mention two of them in my talk. But uh, uh, the one that uh, is kind of uh, relevant is uh, that uh, again, Carl Heckman and uh, Robin Thomas uh, proved that if you take a planar uh, subcubic triangle free graph, then it has independence, uh, this independence ratio at least three over eight, which kind of indicates that we might be in, some, uh, in like good shape for proving that they have um, uh, fractional chromatic number eight over three. And indeed, this is what uh, what they what they conjectured that if you have a planar subcubic triangle free graph, then you can always fractionally coloring color it uh, using eight over three colors. And uh, I mean, this uh, this uh, would be this would be optimal uh, because, uh, for example, I've shown you in in the beginning that if you take this graph uh, then it has a fractional chromatic number precisely eight over three um, and this uh, this uh, this conjecture is still uh, still still open. It seems to be quite hard to get uh, get to this bound, even just for planar uh, planar graphs. Uh, but there has been some uh, some uh, uh, recent progress on at least or like on this uh, independence uh, ratio thing. So uh, uh, Okay, uh, this was, I guess, a year or two ago. Uh, Games van Battenburg, uh, Gatkeber, and uh, Jure have proved uh, that you can get this uh, independence ratio 3 over n, 
not assuming uh, the plenarity, but just forbidding a couple of uh, isolated examples. So there are these six special graphs for which the independence ratio is larger. And if you forbid them as subgraphs, let's say, then you can uh, get to, to the, to the uh, independence ratio CO, right? And this gives another proof for this theorem of uh, Heckman and Thomas, because as you can observe, all of these six special graphs are non-planar. So they cannot appear in a, in a planar graph. And uh, therefore, given, uh, given this, it is very natural, to, uh, much, very natural to conjecture that these are also like the only sporadic examples for the fractional chromatic number. That uh, if you, let's say, forbid these graphs as subgraphs, then a triangle-free subqubit graph should have a fractional chromatic number at most eight over three. And uh, additionally, uh, there are constructions of uh, like more complicated, well, complicated graphs which have uh, this uh, independence ratio, well, uh, which are subcubic, triangle free, and they have uh, this independence ratio three over eight. So uh, that is, you, 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 it seems you cannot uh, cannot get uh, further than this one third by excluding just like sporadic examples. And so like if you have, uh, have a look at these, uh, these uh, excluded graphs here, so we see we have here these two graphs, which we have seen before with fractional chromatic number 14 over five. Uh, then we have here this pair of, uh, of graphs with uh, fractional chromatic number 11 over four, which is slightly smaller and uh, then you have here uh, this these two graphs with uh, fractional chromatic number 19 over 7 which uh, which is even smaller and uh, so unfortunately we cannot uh, cannot prove this uh, prove this conjecture uh, but uh, we can prove like the first step towards towards it, like here in this chain of uh, sporadic graphs. So we can prove that if you forbid uh, these uh, these two, then you will get uh, a fractional chromatic number uh, eleven over four. So then the next step is forbidding x, then the next step is forbidding this. So I guess we are like one third of the way to proving this conjecture. Unfortunately, it's, uh, I think, the easiest third of the way. So, so this is a result with uh, Bernard Lidicki and uh, with uh, Luke Postle, uh, which we obtained, I guess, about a well, year and a half ago. We still were able to travel and uh, do things in person. Uh, unfortunately, we, we then, well, we wrote the first draft and then we didn't get to revise it and polish it so far. But uh, I mean, I trust the, trust this result. I, we checked it quite thoroughly, but uh, it's, it's not published yet. So we'll take it with a pinch of salt. So. Um, and uh, okay, so we have this result and of course, because uh, uh, these two forbidden graphs are uh, non-planar. Uh, this it follows that planar subcubic triangle-free graphs have fractional from also fractional chromatic number at most eleven over four, which is the best improvement that we have towards this uh, conjecture of uh, Ekman and Thomas. Okay, so let me say a couple of words about uh, about the proof of the theorem. I mean, the proof is uh, quite technical, so I will not go into many details, but I, I would like to say kind of a, the basic ideas that, that we used. And uh, I mean, the very basic idea 
is uh, actually the one that uh, that we also employed to uh, to prove uh, the previous result about 14 over 5 and uh, in this this idea uh, idea that before originates in in these papers by uh, Heckman and Thomas about uh, the independence uh, number and that is uh, that we will uh, actually show something uh, something stronger so we will be like so suppose we are this uh, subcubic triangle free graph which is not one of these exceptional ones and uh, we would like to get its fractional coloring coloring which uses colors of total measure 11 over 4 on vertices of degree 3 we, we want to as to vertices of degree 3 we want to assign color set of measure one, but to vertices of smaller degree, vertices of degree two, we want to actually uh, assign even larger sets. So we want to make it harder for us to get, uh, get the coloring. And in, in particular, we want to get, let's say on vertices of degree two, we want to get five over four colors. So that's kind of, uh, kind of makes, uh, makes sense. I mean, vertices of uh, small degree are less constrained so they are should be easier to color so why not and this gives us then more power for for the induction hypothesis and so if uh, if this claim which i wrote here actually was true here is kind of a way how you can prove it so let's uh, let's for simplicity assume uh, that our graph is three regular and it, let's say that it has girls at least five. It doesn't contain four cycles. Uh, then you can uh, do the following. So for each vertex, we delete this vertex and uh, all of its neighbors. We apply the induction hypothesis to the resulting graph. So this gives us uh, a coloring where everyone has one color except that except for these vertices of degree two each of them has five over two five over four colors and then we can extend the color uh, the coloring to the original graph so uh, I mean this uh, this uh, these vertices each take uh, take up five over four colors so together they can cover 10 over four colors. We are using 11 over four colors. So we certainly are able to give one, one quarter, well, colors of measure one quarter to these vertices. And well, they all together cover, uh, cover three quarters of the measure. And so we can give eight quarters to this, uh, to this vertex. So that's not quite what we wanted. We have a couple of vertices here where we have too many colors. So we have here this, uh, these six vertices here, which are getting by one quarter, by one quarter color more than they need. And we have this central vertex, which gets actually by a huge amount of color more than it needs. But unfortunately, we also have these, uh, these neighbors which, uh, which get three quarters, sorry, uh, yeah, three quarters less than, uh, than what, uh, what, the, what they need. So what do we do? Well, we get, we got this coloring, not just for, for a single vertex, but we got, uh, got it for every vertex of our graph. So we have these N fractional colorings of our graph. And then we go back to this uh, to this fact about the linear, uh, let's say linear programming formulation, from which it follows that you can take the convex con combination of uh, these colorings. And what this uh, what this does is that it uh, it's simply like averages or well the the sizes the measures of the sets that we are giving to each vertex. So for e for each vertex, we have this one coloring that gives is gives 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 it by one color more than it needs then we have these three colorings that we obtain for the three neighbors which give uh, give it three quarters less 
then we have these six colorings for the vertices at distance two, which give it one quarter more. And then we have these remaining and minus 10 colorings, which give it precisely as many colors as it, it, as it needs. And so if you sum it, sum it up, every vertex will end up with slightly more than one color, slightly more color than it, uh, than it needs. And uh, yeah, so this, uh, this would be the end of the proof. Of course, I mean we need to we need to deal with uh, with uh, with these assumptions. So we will somehow need to deal with uh, vertices of degree two and uh, four cycles. And uh, when you try to do that, everything starts starts crashing. And I mean the problem is that actually the way that I wrote this claim it is uh, it is false. There is quite a large number of counterexamples, uh, but uh, it turns out that there are. Oh, 176 minimal counterexamples, and uh, if you if you forbid them, uh, then uh, then this becomes uh, becomes true. Um, and then you have to fight with this. I mean, fight a lot. I mean, you need uh, you need to be. Uh, I mean, you here uh, the ways you get rid of vertices of degree two and uh, four cycles so that you do kind of some kind of reducible configuration stuff. So I don't know how you get rid of a four cycle where so you have this, this four cycle. So you uh, delete this four cycle from your graph and maybe replace it by uh, by uh, something, uh, something else, something smaller. And uh, you get a fractional coloring of this modified graph and then you argue that uh, you can always extend this fractional coloring back to this uh, deleted four cycle. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, there is a, a problem that when you deleted this four cycle and edit uh, this, uh, this uh, thing to perform the reduction, you might have created one of these 176 forbidden obstructions and then you need to deal with this in some different way. So then you know that somehow in, uh, in your original graph, you have all this four cycle, which in some way attaches to part of this, uh, this obstruction. And what you do is you consider both of them together as single large reducible configuration and you keep fighting it eventually it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it works. And of course, uh, we didn't uh, check uh, this that this is all of this is true for 176 graph by hand we need to uh, have computer to, to help us and there are some more tricks that uh, that uh, that you need to, uh, to to do in order to uh, in order to succeed so I mean here uh, we uh, in this uh, in this formulation, uh, I'm requiring that on every vertex of degree two, I must have this uh, uh, set of colors of measure five over four. But uh, for for these in inductive uh, arguments, it is uh, it is convenient uh, to add some vertices of degree to only allow only require uh, less colors on the uh, allow me, uh, colors of, uh, of measure one. So basically you kind of remember which vertices originally had had a degree three in your in your starting graph. So when you get to the to this to, to induce subgraph, you don't necessarily require for to have more more colors on them if you don't uh, don't need it. And then uh, of course, uh, for the, because we are doing these computer assisted arguments, you need to work out how to actually check that a configuration is uh, reducible completely automatically. So it turns out that uh, uh, again, you go to this uh, linear programming formulation and it turns out that you need in some polyhedron to enumerate all the vertices then and for each vertex of this polyhedron, you need to solve some linear program. So it, uh, it, it kind of, uh, kind of really turned out to push uh, uh, 
by the computational power that we had quite uh, quite to its limit. So if uh, if we needed to, uh, so so I mean this reducibility of the of this configuration, the the, the bad bad part here is the this enumeration of of the vertices of some polyhedron, which uh, can uh, the size of the polyhedron depends like how many edges are sticking out from this configuration that you are reducing. And basically we think that uh, we, we would be able to manage, like we needed to, to deal with configurations with, I guess, five edges sticking out. We probably would be able to deal with those with six edges sticking out. But uh, I, I think we would be really pushing it if we needed to deal with larger configurations. Okay, so these are like a couple of things for the proof to give you some idea how it uh, how it goes. Um, for the rest of my talk, let me actually uh, tell you something uh, something related. It turns out to be actually quite related to this uh, question of uh, Heckman and Thomas regarding the fractional chromatic number of planar graphs, but it may not be completely obvious at the, at the beginning. So this just a warning, um, but, and, uh, well, the thing that I'm telling actually has something, anything to do with what, uh, what, uh, uh, what I am speaking about so far. And that is, let's, uh, let's switch to a different notion of coloring. So what is a clustered coloring? So in a normal coloring, what we uh, what we require is that any color class is an independent set. So what this means, if you take vertices in the subgraph induced by vertices of the same color, each component of this subgraph has size one. This is just a single vertex. And uh, then you can take a relaxation when where you say that Okay, let's not uh, require the color classes to be independent set, but let's just require that each color class induces a subgraph where every component is small, where every component has at most S vertices. So this gives you this notion of uh, clustered coloring and uh, why why is this uh, why is this uh, notion interesting I mean well there are a lot of uh, a lot of hard conjectures where we are stuck and then if you consider this relaxation you can uh, get uh, well, at least uh, at least somewhere so um, in this cluster uh, cluster setting we now have like very nice results, let's say, towards like Hardwiger's conjecture and uh, Hewitt's conjecture, uh, sorry, he was um, um, Hayashi's conjecture and things like that. So, um, I mean, it's uh, it's kind of a interesting, uh, interesting, uh, uh, interesting notion. So, what is say this clustered chromatic number for a class of graphs will be the minimum number a such that for some size s for some clustering for every graph from this class it has this uh, s cluster coloring using a colors so um, this this s is can be huge but it is fixed for this class class of the graphs so as examples what is uh, what is known there is uh, there are some uh, general results for graphs with bounded maximum degree and there are many uh, results for some special class classes. And for me, the interesting one, ones are those for uh, for the planar graphs, where Esper and Jure proved uh, that the right answer is three. That uh, any planar graph you can color using three colors, or planar graph with bounded maximum degree you can color using three colors, so that uh, uh, each monochromatic component is small. The size of the component somehow depends on this maximum degree, but uh, given this maximum degree, it is fixed. And they have also shown that you cannot do better than three. 
but it turns out that you can do better than three if you uh, go to the for again to the fractional setting. So you can uh, define fractional clustered coloring in the same way as we got from the ordinary coloring to the fractional coloring. So again, we will be uh, assigning to vertices sets of uh, measure one, such that for each single color, if you have a look at all the vertices at which this color appears in the set of colors of this vertex, this, uh, this uh, subset of vertices induces a subgraph where each component has bounded size, size at most s. And uh, then you can try defining uh, uh, this uh, clustered fractional chromatic number of a class of graphs. We could try to do it uh, in the same as here, as some minimum, except here it turns out that the minimum does not necessarily exist. It can be that, uh, uh, that uh, for any epsilon greater than zero, you can do uh, the clustered fractional chromatic number using A plus epsilon colors such that the clusters have some size F of epsilon, or at most F of epsilon, but you cannot do it ex using exactly A colors, like using exactly A colors, um, the, the clusters, uh, well, the, well, you cannot, cannot enforce small, uh, small the, the, this, this cluster coloring. So, for, so uh, well, you, for, the, for, this, for this reason, we basically define this, uh, this uh, cluster fractional chromatic number of a graph, class of graphs as the infimum of, of the values of A for, for, for which uh, you, can, you can do this. And uh, then we can also be interested in how does the size of clusters uh, depend on uh, this value of epsilon. So how does it depend on as, as we go closer and closer to the number of colors? So let's call this the speed of the clustered coloring, the clustered fractional coloring in the class. And uh, it turns out that uh, for every, let's say hereditary class of graphs, it's strongly sublinear separator. So if you don't know what this is, imagine for planar graphs, as an example, but this is much, of course, much more general. Uh, this uh, cluster fractional chromatic number is one. So you can, uh, you can go as close to just using just one color as, uh, as you want. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, this, this, this bound that on, on the size of the clusters, depending on, on epsilon here is in general pretty bad, but for Planar graphs, uh, you can do something uh, very reasonable. So with uh, Jean-Sebastien Sereni, we have shown that to do this uh, fractional chromatic, uh, fractional, uh, uh, fraction, uh, pastel fractional coloring using one plus epsilon colors, you need to have clusters of size roughly uh, maximum degree minus one to one over epsilon. And this cannot be improved even for trees, you cannot, cannot get smaller clusters. And uh, okay, so how is, this, uh, how is this relevant? It turns out that uh, uh, you can now combine these, uh, combine these coloring. So, uh, for the, so if, if, if you just have a look at it for the, for the ordinary chromatic number, so how can you uh, how can you do a coloring of your graph? So you can first do a, a let's say a clustering a clustered coloring. So you do some coloring such that in each color class the clusters have size. Eh? So let's say you do this using uh, C colors, and then maybe using some different argument, you can inside each of these components do the coloring separately, and uh, then you will get a so so if you in, in if inside each of these components you can do it using B colors, 
then you will get a proper coloring using using C times B colors. And the same turns out to be true for these fractional colorings. So if you have uh, this cluster fractional chromatic number C at some speed F, then the fractional uh, chromatic number of your class is at most C plus epsilon times the maximum of the fractional chromatic numbers of the graphs in the class, which have at most uh, F of epsilon vertices. So uh, in particular, let's uh, let's go back to this uh, uh, conjecture of uh, Hetman and Thomas that for planar graphs, we have this bound on the fractional chromatic number, which is at most eight over three. And suppose that we do not want to prove it exactly, but want to just get some result which is close to uh, close to this that we would like to get a bound of form that the, that the fractional chromatic number is at most eight over three times one plus epsilon. Well, then uh, using this result that we that we uh, that we had here, well, we know that. Planar graphs have uh, clustered chromatic number of one, one, one plus epsilon with clusters of size uh, delta minus one two to one over epsilon plus, plus something small. And then presu uh, presumably this, uh, this conjecture is true. So if for these finitely many graphs, you verify that they have actually fractional chromatic number at most eight over three, then you would be getting your result for all planar graphs. Unfortunately, um, since uh, since uh, since we would uh, well, for this to make uh, make any kind of sense, we would like to get the better result than what we have um, uh, already. Uh, sorry, eleven over eleven over four. Uh, which uh, which means that uh, you would probably need to have epsilon to be rather small, maybe on the order like one over twenty or something like that. Which means that you would need to verify something for graphs with like two to the twenty, which is like million vertices, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, not well, it's not feasible to just uh, do them all by brute force. So, I mean, this gives you a, a theoretical way how you could, uh, how you could get uh, arbitrarily close to this, uh, to this conjecture using just a finite amount of work. But unfortunately, the finite amount of work is too large for this to approach that should be practical. Okay, so that's, I guess, everything that I wanted to tell you. Thank you, Zdenek. Let us uh, all thank the speaker. Um, are there any questions? So, Zdenek, do we know um, any the this uh, original Heckman Thomas conjecture? Any special classes of that class that uh, is true? Uh... Uh, I mean, uh, yes, and I mean, not uh, no, nothing, nothing really, uh, nothing really good. I mean, it's uh, it's known to be true uh, for uh, if you if you assume that the girl is large enough. So if you if you forbid instead of triangles if you forbid uh, cycles of length at least I guess seven is probably enough well for for large for, for large enough course but mm -hmm. I don't I don't know like anything that would be a substantially general so yeah like see for, for instance what about if it, this graph has a Hamiltonian cycle does would that be helpful? Uh, Hamiltonian cycle. I don't know. No, I don't. I, I don't know. Okay. 
Thanks. I can't say that it wouldn't be, but uh, no, I don't know. Okay. Any more questions? Um, so these conjectures are all open for the fractional chromatic number. Is it is anything known if you use, say, like the fractional multiple generalization of the fractional chromatic number, if you know what that is? <laughs> Um, maybe could you say what what that is? Um, so what? say you take the LP definition as or lemma as the definition for fractional chromatic number, and mm -hmm. instead of waiting over say independent sets, you could wait over all bipartite subgraphs. That would be like the first extension. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh... You could like pick a graph H, and wait over all. And do subgraphs. Sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, I don't. I, I haven't thought about it. I, I, I don't know. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, if there are no more questions, then let us thank the speaker again for the wonderful talk. And our speaker next week will be Sandra Kingan from uh, QE.